looking today at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. And uh, so let me begin reading at verse 8. I'll read to verse 14. And as is the way I normally do things, I'm going to be giving you some reminders. Just for those who haven't been with us, you're going to be up to speed when I, continue, when I complete that. And the rest of us will just move on in to verse 8 and pick up where we left off last time. So I'll begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 8. I'll read to verse 14, and we'll get into our introduction and our study. So Paul writes, Ephesians 5, verse 8, For you, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That sounds like one of my Sunday morning messages to the church. Awake, you who sleep. But anyway, let's, uh, let's do a little bit of a background. We'll remind ourselves of a few things and get into our study. In chapter 5, verse 1, we saw how that, that Paul had exhorted Christians, and he had exhorted us as believers to be imitators of God. I was pointing out that being an imitator of God means to follow him. He's our model. Uh, we are to emulate him. We're actually to copy him. So as Christians, we imitate his speech. We imitate his actions. And we even imitate his motivations. We hear his speech as we read the Bible. We see his actions in what we read that he does. And as for his heart, he clearly reveals his heart for us in so many places in Scripture. Uh, one passage, Deuteronomy 5.29, says it well. There the Lord says, if only they had such a heart in them to fear me and keep all my commandments always so that it would go well with them and with their sons forever. What is his heart? That it might go well with us and with our children. Now, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, but we can apply that to ourselves in that we are his children also. In Isaiah 54, verse 10, the mountains may depart, the hills be removed. But God says, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So it's this kind of knowledge that provokes us as believers to seek to please him. It's the knowledge that God loves us. And we know the scriptures, many of them, that speak concerning his love for us, the most famous obviously being in, in the New Testament in John chapter 3, verse 16. We all know that scripture God so loved the world, and it's demonstrated according to Romans 5, verse 8, uh, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God has revealed his love to us in what he has done to save us. And, and it's that kind of knowledge that propels us to please him as well as propels us to share the gospel with those who are lost. You see, John 3, 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath abides. God's wrath remains on him. God's wrath abides on them. And therefore, we give them the word of God to set them free as they, as they take it and, and apply it to their, them, their own lives by faith. So Christians cultivate a life that is intentionally directed towards being pleasing to the Lord. I read to you last time, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, for Paul said, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you want to walk to please and to please God. So the desire for the Lord is to motivate us as believers to spend a lifetime, not just a week, not just a month, just a day, but an everyday lifetime until he takes us to be with him. It's what motivates us to pursue him. Psalm 42, verse 1 says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. So in our desire to be with him, our lives begin to become structured, disciplined. We begin to pursue the things that please him, and we begin to habitually reject those things that don't. 
In 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, Paul said, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So that's why we read his word. That's why we pray. That's why we fellowship. And that's why we share our faith. These are the basic things that we do because we love him and because we're pursuing him. So we noted that Paul taught us to reject the inclinations of our flesh, our sinful desires. And he pointed out that our flesh is inclined to various sins. He didn't give a whole list of them, but he gave enough for us to understand uh, what he's speaking of. He said that we're to, we're to um, reject uh, fornication and sexual uncleanness, sexual parasitism, filthy speech, empty-headed talking, sexual language that is filled with double meanings. Because that would exhibit a walk that is called worthy of the calling by which we have been called. We've already looked at this, but again, our flesh wars against our spirit because we've had a lifetime of being molded by the thoughts intense and by the example of the world that has rejected God. And so because of this, we intentionally reject the desires that we war against. So he said we are to consciously reject fornication and that sexual uncleanness and all those other things. And this way of life must never be associated with Christian living. In Ephesians 5, 3, he said, let it not even be named among you as befits or as is fitting for saints. So that kind of lifestyle that he said we're not to, to pursue and be part of, uh, it runs counter to what the Lord has taught us. And it, it runs counter to how God is molding us into his own image. Now, remember in verse six, Paul had warned us that, that people would try to deceive us with empty words. In other words, people will try to convince us that God allows Christians to live that kind of life. It's okay, they'll say, to continue because God is gracious and, and God is loving and he certainly will not condemn or judge you. Well, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, God didn't call us to uncleanness. God called us in holiness. And so he doesn't intend us to continue living unclean lives. He didn't call us in that fashion, but called us to live for him. Not only can others convince you that it's permissible to continue in sin, but you can also deceive yourself. You can convince yourself that what you're doing isn't wrong. And even when your friends and family are warning you, <laughs> you just call them hypocrites and you say they're wrong. They don't understand you. They don't know your heart, right? Well, Proverbs 12, 15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So why do we find ourselves defending sin in our lives? It's often rooted in a lack of fear of God, and it's also often rooted in a misunderstanding of God's grace. You see, when we don't fear God, anything and everything can become permissible. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, verse 6, it's by the fear of the Lord that one departs from evil. In Proverbs 14, it says, uh, uh, in verse 16, it says, a wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. So Paul was speaking of that again in verses 6 and 7, and he concluded, because of these things, the wrath of God comes. These are the things he's judging humanity for. So Paul would question us and say, so how can the church continue in them? Therefore, verse 7 do not be partakers with them. Do not join the world in its evil. Instead of imitating the world, imitate God. And so now we pick up at verse 8, where he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You were once darkness. Darkness, before we were saved, we were by nature walking in spiritual darkness. We had no spiritual light within us, and, and it was our lifestyle and our habit to walk in the dark. In Romans 121, it speaks of humanity, and it says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. You see, before Jesus saved us, we lived in darkness. Our lifestyles reflected that. We saw in chapter 2, verse 3 of Ephesians, that we, we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. We fulfilled the desire of the flesh and mind. And he said, and we were by nature children of wrath. 
In the book of Titus, in chapter 3, verse 3, he said, We ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So, obviously, it's always important to remember what we were without Jesus, because when we remember what we were like, we can, we can have humility, but we can also have sensitivity towards other people. One of the things that we have to, as Christians, be very careful about is getting to the point where we don't understand how people can do the things that they do. Uh, one of the things I've heard Christians say in the past that I think is an unwise thing is when they ask somebody, how could you do that? Um, I don't know about you, but I know me, and I know that I was able to do that very easily uh, and without any regret, without any remorse, without any sense of shame, I was able to do those things because I liked it. And so when somebody says, how could you do those things? You ought to remember how, because you used to do those things yourself. It was your lifestyle too. See, but what happens is we, we start drawing closer to the Lord. And as we draw closer to the Lord, uh, we, we leave those things behind to the degree sometimes that we forget what we were. Uh, a long time ago, I made a decision in my own life uh, to, to never forget what I was, to never forget that. It, and it's helped me in my walk with the Lord. It's not that I ever want to go back to that. Who wants to go back to the past? Who wants to be the dog who returns to the vomit or the pig that returns to the mud? Who wants to be that? I don't. Have I done that? Yes. Was it pleasant? No. As a matter of fact, it was sometimes when I, in my early days, when I started moving back to, to the past, it's, it's what awoke me sometimes to the reality of the fact that this is what I escaped. Why am I returning to it? Why am I going back to the things that I had forsaken? Because those things gave me pleasure for the moment, but guilt for a long time. Why would I return to those things? And so sometimes people have this tendency of saying, oh, I don't know how you can do that. How did you go back? You need to always remember yourself. My mom said to me, you can point your finger, one finger at other people, but remember three fingers are pointing back at you. And then that's true. Now, again, that's not, that's not permission for somebody to go out and continue sin so nobody judges them. Who are you to judge me? I, I mean, some people say, who are you to judge me, bro? You know, well, come on, shut up. You know, it, 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 it's, it, that's not what is happening. Sometimes you're simply convicted. But if we have a heart to see people saved, we'll be very careful that we don't come on as if we're condemning them. That's very important to be aware of. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, beautiful scripture, who makes you... Uh, differ from another. What do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Who makes you to differ from another, and what do you have that you haven't received? What makes me different? You know, it, nothing makes me different other than the fact that I'm a saved sinner, washed by the blood of Christ, moving in a new direction, but aware of what I've been to the degree that I don't want to condemn somebody for what they're doing because they're blind, they don't know the Lord, they need to be set free. Does this mean that we don't speak that evil is evil? No, of course we will speak about those things. Yes, we have to because that's how people can know because we're identifying the things that they're doing and saying God is not pleased with that. That's what the Word of God's intended to do. But it isn't intended for me to become the judge of that person. God is their almighty judge. But what I do is I give them the truth and prayerfully they'll hear it. But I never want to get to the point where I don't understand how they did that or why they did that. Because even without Christ, we can do so many things. And many of you remember that very well. So it's with humility that we reach out to others. The way that others reached out to us. We share the gospel when given opportunity. We do so with grace and love, even as Jesus did. So walking in darkness. Well, walking in darkness was our former way of life, but it is not the way we are now. Those things are no longer true for us because we've been rescued. In Colossians 1.13, it says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us, into the kingdom of the son of his love, delivered and translated, taken out and placed somewhere else, delivered from the power of darkness. So he says it in verse eight, you were once darkness, 
But now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. Once you were spiritually darkened, but now you have a new spiritual condition. Jesus is the true light, and Jesus provides spiritual light in a sin-darkened world. He said in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So we who are born again, are actual partakers or sharers of the divine nature, the nature of Jesus, and we share in his light. You say, that sounds heretical, Pastor. Wait a minute. You know, I was with you up to that point. But you say that we share the nature that Jesus has? I didn't make that up. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says it like this. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers, which means partner, companion, or sharer, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's what it means to be born again. You have a new nature. You have been brought into the family of God. And this new nature is part of the reality of the born again experience. So no, when you got saved, you were given the power of, of God to dwell within you, giving you the ability to serve him because you have been now transformed. You've been taken out of this evil world and you have been translated into the kingdom of his son. And you are now a son of God or a daughter of God through the born again experience. And as a born again person, we live as children of light and actually become a light to those in darkness. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So he goes on and begins to speak now of what our life is to be. Notice in verse 9, he says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So a walk in the light is revealed by spiritual truth. This fruit is the natural product of abiding in Jesus Christ. The result is that we live noticeably different lives in the world. Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, people aren't always impressed by this. Sometimes their desire may be to put out that light. And because we're now in the Lord... He provides the impulse to pursue him. Be, before, if God said, this is right, you would say, no, this is wrong. If God said, this is sweet, by nature, I would have said, no, it's sour. If God would have said, this is high, I'd have said, no, it's low. I, I would do the opposite, whatever he would say. And it's part of my nature. It's part of all of our nature. And we still retain a battle against those things. And you see this every day. You just may not realize it. Uh, what happens when you come to a stop sign and there's nobody around? I'll wait. <laughs> but you don't. A lot of <laughs> Even the small things, that's the point I'm making. Even the small things, like stopping at a stop sign. You know, in the, in the, in the last several years, I have, I have become much more aware that that stop to many people is a suggestion. And it's not, a, it's not a law to do that. I also am aware of those things when I come to a, um, to a uh, traffic light because sometimes someone's going to blow through a red light. I'm aware of those things when I'm driving on the freeway when it says 65. Once again, it's a suggestion. It's actually the start of the Indi Indianapolis 500 when you get on, that, on the freeway. And uh, those kinds of things. And you see that and I see that. These are the small things. These are really the small things. These are not the hard things. These are not the difficult things. These are stopping at a stop sign, watching the, your speed limit, showing courtesy to other people. And yet, it's something like we say, no, you're, you're, tra you're trampling my rights, man. I have the right. Who are you to tell me what to do? And that's kind of the attitude that people have today. There was a time when the Christian church was known for its, its willingness to abide by, the, by laws, and, and we are the most law-abiding people. Yes, there are times, because I have to say this because of myself, there are times when you need to resist those laws because the law doesn't make it right. And there are things that we sometimes as believers will resist. Yes, we do, and of course we do, and we should do. 
But under normal circumstances, we ought to be the most law-abiding citizens in the, in the planet. We ought to be. Why? Because we live by a higher law. And we understand what right is. We understand what wrong is and all of that. Well, at one time, we were, um, we were really to be blamed. We weren't blameless. We weren't harmless. And <laughs> sometimes when people see the way that we live, they don't like that. Well, what we do is we abide in Christ. In John 15, verse 4, Jesus said it like this. He said, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The fruit of the Spirit is something that is a natural production of being rooted and grounded in Christ. You know, I have fruit trees in the backyard. Some have survived my, my brown thumb. I don't have a green thumb. I kill things very easily. But I have some fruit trees in my backyard that have miraculously survived. They have. And, and it, it, I have a lemon tree. Um, I have an orange tree, tangerine tree. I, you know, I've got some trees in the backyard. And I like these trees. They're cool. And they produce fruit. And that's cool, too. But I have never gone into the backyard ever when it's time to produce fruit. I've never gone in the backyard and seen a tree struggling to produce an orange. I just have never seen, have you? Have you ever seen a tree just, I'm gonna produce the biggest orange you've ever seen? Have you ever? No, why not? Because they don't struggle to produce. Because fruit is the natural result of a healthy tree that is, is, is rooted and grounded in healthy soil. That's why. So if you water it, take care of it, fertilize it. You know, if you prune it, if you do those things that are, are, are good to do, or, or if you're like me, you don't do anything, they still produce fruit. And, and it's not a strain. Listen, here's the thing that's a key, and this has been a key in my life, and I want to share it with you, because this is basically what we're looking at in this passage, speaking about producing fruit. Abide in me, and I will abide in you, Jesus said. Put your roots deeply into him. Be rooted and grounded in his love, and enjoy him. And I've discovered that, you know, the times that I have said, I want to be loving, I want to be patient, I want to be kind, are the times that I'm none of those things. Because I'm trying to force myself to produce fruit. And sometimes I've produced counterfeit fruit. It looks like it. Oh, Pastor David, you're the most patient person in the world. It looks like it. But in fact, uh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I've shared this before. I don't know why it comes to mind. Some of you have heard this more than once, but, you know, it takes a living tree to produce a living fruit. You can pretend all you want, but when tested, it's, it's shown to be a counterfeit. You can go to some of these shops and you can, you can look at these, this plastic fruit and, and it looks so real. You've seen it. I've seen it when I've been dragged into shops to look at this stuff. And I was pretending to have patience when, in fact, I wasn't. But you, you can go in there, and you can take one of these counterfeits, and you can put it in the midst of the real. And when you look at the bowl of fruit, it looks like it's real. But all you need to do is pick it up, and you know this is phony. In the trying, in the testing, it's revealed for what it really is. That's the way it works. And some plastic looks real. We had moved into a house, and, and the, the owners before us had left behind a, an ivy. And, and you know, I, I said, well, you know, this is a housewarming present. I, I don't know where they took off to, so this is now mine. And so I would go out. True, a lot of you have heard me say this, but it's true. I would go out and water it. I watered it every week. And, you know, just watering that plant, man, you know, I'm going to, you're going to survive. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you, little plant. And it was so good. Sometimes I would even pat the leaf and I'd say, you're such a good little plant. And I still remember, true, that's true. Then I, I remember one day I forgot I have not watered this plant for a month. And uh, I had forgot, oh my goodness. So I went outside and I turned on the hose and I walked up to the plant and I was looking at it. And I thought, wow, you're still green. You're so green. And I reached down, you're such a good little, it was plastic. All this, all this, 
I said, it's true. It was the only green thing I had, and it was fake. You know, I learned a long time ago, and it's true. I can, I can do all that's inside. I can try so hard to be loving. But I'm not. I can try so hard to be patient. But I lose my patience. So I learned, and I'm learning, that it isn't me trying to produce fruit because I'll only produce artificial fruit. But when I am abiding in Christ, when I'm having fellowship with him, when I'm, I'm looking at his word, when I'm in prayer, when I'm caring for people, that's when the fruit is shown. That's when the fruit is real. It's because you're abiding. That's why Jesus said, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Don't try and produce something you don't have. The reason you got saved is because you didn't have those things. And now you're trying to run around like, you know, Joe Christian, you know, the best. Oh, look at He's got a 200-pound Bible he carries. And, you know, <laughs> look at the size of that cross he carries on his back, you know. And, and he's got 15 different stickers on his window. That is a real Christian. No, you, you discover your real Christianity when you're pressed. And so what we are as Christians is we abide in the Lord, and the power of his Holy Spirit will produce the fruit. And... And it's not something you strain at. It's just something that God naturally produces. And so Paul is sharing this with us. And he's telling us what this fruit is. Notice he begins to tell us in verse 9 that the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is in goodness, righteousness, and truth. So that is what's produced by abiding in Jesus, the true vine. It's not produced through our own efforts. It's produced as we rest in him. And so the walk in the light is revealed by goodness. That word goodness speaks of something that is morally excellent. Goodness is moral excellence. It speaks of an uprightness of, of a heart and life. And, and that goodness uh, is walking in love. In other words, it's demonstrated as we seek the best for others. He speaks of righteousness. The word righteousness is that which is morally right or just. And that is often shown by opposition to injustice. It is also revealed by a desire to be blameless. Now, when he speaks of truth, that speaks of being reliable, being honest, being filled with integrity, being trustworthy. It's not something that you only speak, but it's how you live. In, in Psalm 15, verses 1 through 3, the question is asked, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? The answer is supplied. He whose walk is blameless and who does, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart, has no slander on his tongue, who, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man. Who may dwell in your holy hill? The man who walks uprightly. The one who is filled with truth and integrity. It's like when Jesus in Matthew 5, 37 simply said, let your yes be yes and your no, let it be no. Let us as believers, in other words, be so trustworthy that you don't have to sign documents proving that you will pay that, you will pay that bill. May it be so much in your heart that you can be trusted. There was a time when uh, we didn't have 15 different ways to show that we were able to pay a bill. Our word was our bond. Those days are pretty much gone now. But they're, they're, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be true to our word. That doesn't mean that we should say yes when, in fact, we meant no. And so what we have to have and what we should have is a reliability. We need to have an honesty. We need to have integrity. And all of this, he says in verse 10, is proving but it's acceptable to the Lord. Well, when he says proving, that word proving means to test or to try. It's discovering through effort what is pleasing to God. So you're going to be continually seeking what is pleasing to him because you love him. And as you continue to seek God, your knowledge of God and his will will deepen over time. 
Uh, anybody here who's married will understand this illustration. Uh, <laughs> you get married. I feel sorry for you, but you get married. <laughs> and the mask comes off. I don't want to go too deeply in this. I'll do that when we, when we get into our marriage and family segment, but the mask comes off. Who you really are is exposed over time. If you had a proper dating relationship and all of that, and you did the right things that you ought to be doing, you know, you're, you're normally, normally, you're normally on your best behavior. You normally are. I mean, what guy wants the girl to think he's a jerk? That comes after marriage. <laughs> so naturally, you, 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 you show up on time. You open the door for her so she can get in the car and all. Uh, her, her wish is your command. You know, whatever you want, baby, I'll do it for you. I, I want you to know how much I love you. I, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you. And you do. You go home mad. She's demanding, but when you're with her, you smile a lot. You actually pay the bill for her meal. For some reason, she always thinks that lobster is a good thing, but you, you'll do that. <laughs> you're polite. You're respectful. You win her. And then you're married. I've said this before, but I say it now, I'll say it quickly. Um, what you were before you got married is the way you ought to be after you're married. You ought to even be improving. What she saw was a foretaste of what she was going to have for a lifetime. So I wanted to be a better man. See, Marie, when she met me and I began to ask her out, it was so casual and so friendly. We just enjoyed each other to this day. That's really been the cement in our relationship is we actually like each other. We actually, and some people don't. When are you going to go back to work? No, <laughs> I'm retired. Oh, no. Lots of projects around the house, baby. I'll get you a little tool belt out and all of that. When are you going to go back? You're driving me crazy. But... It, it, for me, it, it took probably three or four years for me to realize that um, I needed to be a better man than I was. I needed to improve my behavior for her sake. Because at a certain point, I came to realize that she fell in love with a certain man. But I needed to be even better than when she was dating me. See, one of the things with Marie and me, and I really, you know, this is not in my notes and I just feel like talking about it. Um, I, w I, never, I wasn't a dater, you know, I didn't go out with a lot of people. I, I was, nobody would go out with me. So I, I, didn't, I didn't have a lot of dates. And for some reason, she liked me. And for re some reason, she'd actually go out when I asked her. So what I chose to do is I chose to be the real person. I, I wasn't going to be that person who said, what is it you, you want to do? I wasn't that person. What do you, I, I wasn't the one who said, where do you want to go to eat? You know, I didn't pretend that I liked the food she liked. I didn't pretend that I liked the music she liked. I didn't do any of that. See, a lot of guys do that to con the girl. You know, you like this kind of music? So do I. You like this kind of food? So do I. You like to do these kind? So do I. You know? You wear Daisy Duke, so do I. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> I'm getting the look. <laughs> but you know what I mean. And then when she finally puts that ring on, you get married, it's the I do, and now the real you comes out. I hate those things. I never want to go there again. I never, I only, now what I chose to do, Marie knows this, and is I chose to be me. And when I was me, she actually liked the real one. I never had to go back to pretending 
because I was real all along. And I really think it's important for us to understand that. In our relationships, in our walk with the Lord, we don't want to put something on as if we are a certain way. We want God to produce a genuine fruit in us, a real fruit of goodness, a real fruit of righteousness, a real fruit of truth. We want the real deal. We don't want to pretend we have those things when in fact we don't. What we really want is we want to be real with God. And that's where honest integrity comes from. That's where it comes from. It's the, I want to please you, Lord. So what is it that pleases you? And it's getting into his word. He says, I, I approve of this. Okay, I want to do that. He says, I don't like this. Okay, then, then I won't do that. And that's what happened to me as a believer is I started to read, and as I was reading, and I started to study. As I started to study, I tried to share. Over the years, I began to see things, and I began to say, Lord, I want to please you. Lord, I want to seek you. Uh, Lord, it's because I love you. It's like what it says in Psalm 27, verse 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So that's evidence that you're born again. It's this growing desire to please him. So he says that we're not to have, in verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, he says, but rather expose them. When he says, so when you're walking in this integrity, this goodness, righteousness, this truth, when, when these are the fruit that is being produced in your life, then you're not going to have fellowship. That word fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. The word fellowship speaks of partaking or sharing in. It speaks of par participation. When goodness and righteousness and truth exist in your life, then sin is actually revealed for what it is. So we are not called to simply tolerate sin. By our lives, we expose it for what it is. We are actually producing the contrast in the society that we live in, a society that promotes and, and favors and actually says this is good, by the life that you live, you're actually exposing that these things are not good. And that's what the, the Christian life is intended to do. What happens, though, is when we compromise the standards of the Lord, we will undermine our own witnesses. We're going to quench the power of God's word to change lives as we're quenching the Holy Spirit. Because if we say, oh, yeah, I'm a believer, I follow Jesus Christ, but you're out doing exactly what everybody else does. Why would they want the God that I say they, they need when he's obviously done nothing for me? He hasn't changed you. You're the same way. I remember when I got out of the army, I, um, I took a, I had a girl I knew before I went in the army and I, I went out with her a couple times and, and I, you know, and I was still a new Christian. That's no excuse, but the truth, but I remember that one day she said to me, um, oh, you haven't changed at all. And that hit me so, so deeply, I never saw her again. And I took that to the Lord and I said, God, what a horrible indictment on, on the way I'm living. For somebody who's known me since I was 12 years old, who is saying to me now that I'm 23, you haven't changed at all in all of these years. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget being in my room, just laying there in the dark thinking, God, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want somebody who knew me in the past to say I haven't changed. I don't want to be living like that, talking like that, doing that. I don't want that. God, help me. God, help me to be real. God, help me to be different. God, help me to know you. God, help me to, to live for you in front of people so that they know the sincerity of my faith. I, I don't want to produce this in myself. I, I want you to produce it. I want to walk closer to you. And so I, I, I read his word. I, it was before I began teaching the Bible. She had said this to me. And so in September of 73, I actually began to teach the Bible. I want to know what you're saying, and I want to communicate that to people. And that's how it works. And so I don't want to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I, might, I want my life to be of such nature that it actually exposes what it really is. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, It is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Shameful, that's a word that we don't use today anymore, do we? A lot of people have forgotten this word. This word is blush. And a lot of people have forgotten what that word actually means. People don't blush. 
There used to be a time when you would actually be embarrassed, but a lot of people are not. And no condemnation, just a statement of fact. They're not. They actually take pride in the things that God condemns. And so the Lord says, no, it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. It's shameful to speak about that. Some things are best left unsaid. It's not necessary to give details of some secret sins because God who sees those things that are be done, being done in, in secret, well, he judges those things openly. Psalm 90 verse 8 says it like this. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Jeremiah 23, 24, can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Ecclesiastes 12, 14, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so there are things that people think that they're hiding well and nobody knows it's done in secret, but God sees. They think that they're getting away with it, but God sees. And so God who sees that which is done in secret will judge those things openly. And finally, he says this in verse 13, all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. The word of God and the lives of the people of God, by contrast, expose evil for what it is. The difference between the one who loves Jesus and the one who doesn't should be obvious. The sinful nature of the things exposed can be plainly seen, and that's the work of the light. And it's the light that reveals the works of darkness. And the darkness is exposed when we share the gospel, and the darkness is exposed when we live the gospel before men. And so he finally says in verse 14, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. This is an invitation Awake out of spiritual sleep. Wake up, and Christ will give you the grace to live a new life in him. It's an invitation to awaken from spiritual sleep. It's an invitation to repent. It's an invitation to come to Christ. Psalm 1828, you will light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Christ will give you light. I'll close with a couple of thoughts. One of the things that I've noticed in our day, in our brand of Christianity in the 21st century is very simple. Let me share this with you. Many of you are too young to know this, so I'll share it with you as somebody who's lived for a while and experience the difference. It's very simple. In many ways, the church of the 21st century has lost its way. There are too many blogs that are written by immature Christians that are giving people permission to continue in sin so that grace may abound. There are so many people, some of you see this on social networking, who present themselves as teachers of the word of God, but they don't understand what they're saying and they don't communicate what the scripture actually means. But they'll write long things, and I've read them so many times. I've seen so many of these things where I'm just scratching my head as I read it saying, that's not scripturally sound, that's not true. And then they get all these likes from people saying, yeah, you said it well, and I'm thinking, no, you didn't. I don't want to get on and argue. I could be doing that all day. It wouldn't be hard to, because there's so many things that are being said that are wrong. And so I've been asking the Lord, what, what should we, we do? I, ca I can't speak to the entire church throughout the world, so I have the opportunity to share with you, those who stumble through the door and give me opportunity to speak to you. What do I want to see in our church? I want to see God's love. I want to see the love of God. 
I want to see a heart that is willing to receive people who are a bit different than they are, but can make the difference up by the love of God and the willingness to accept one another. I want a church that hates sin, but loves people. I want a, I want a church that loves God's word and hungers for Bible studies. I want a church that has people who want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to see God move in wonderful ways. Listen, when I first got saved, there were so many odd, weird God things that I experienced that it kept me on the same track for all of these years because I saw things that I only read in the Bible and I was seeing these things in the flesh. These things were happening. People were, I, I, I won't start telling these stories now, but I can tell you it was just such remarkable things that were really weekly events in many ways. And I, I, I came to realize that, that the, the God of this book is still alive. And I also saw revival. I, I saw, see, see people who were, when I was saved, I was 20, so people who were my age, we all became evangelists. All of us in Calvary Chapel, the people who were solid were evangelists. You, you hear of some of the guys who have gone on to legendary status in terms of what God has done for them. You see the, the Raul Reese's who've done wonderful things, the Greg Laurie's who've done great things, and others like them, Mike McIntosh, so many. But what was the heart? What was it with these guys? What was it about them? What was it about those guys that made people like me say, I want to be like that? It was their hunger to see people saved. It was a belief that God would move. It was an awareness of his presence, and it was a way. We did, we did not take God lightly. We respected and reverenced him. We felt church was a place not just to hang around. Church was a place where you came to know God. You were fed, and you'd go out to tell other people. We were very, very evangelistic. All the early Jesus people were evangelistic in one way or another. We didn't know how to evangelize, so we would bring them to church so that Pastor Chuck or Lonnie Frisbee, those were my first guys that I ever listened to, they would, they would tell them how to know God. I was one of these who said, you know, like the woman at the well, come and hear a man who told me everything I've ever done. Can this be Messiah? That's the best I could do. Come and hear a man. I don't know how to tell you about it yet. I'm going to learn how, and one day I will. The best I can do is tell you this. I was blind, now I see, but this person can explain how that happened, and that's how it was. See, we weren't, we weren't once a, a year uh, Christians. Oh, it's Easter, let's go. It's Christmas, let's go. But, you know, we have soccer every Sunday. That's the way it works now. And, but my kids will know Jesus because I do devotions with them. No, they're going to do what you do, and Sunday's going to be a play day. That's what it's going to be. That's what it's going to be. Because they do what you do, not what you say. That's the truth. And so what do I want? I want our church to know Jesus Christ, to walk in the light of God and to love one another the way the Christian faith is supposed to be expressed. And I don't want you ever to come in here expecting me to be perfect and then getting mad if I'm not because I'm not, and I don't care to be. I want to be what God made me to be, not what somebody expects me to be. That's what I want to be. And so I will do what I do. And if I say something dumb and it offends you, tough. That's just, <laughs> that's, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> it's not that I don't love you. It's that I'm not going to be what you want me to be. It's that simple. See, that's how come God uses people like me. It's true. You know what? I fear God, but man's opinion doesn't matter. That's a fact. That's just a fact. And, and it's not that you don't love. It's not that, I think by now I've, I've kind of proven to you that I do, and I do care. But at the bottom of the, uh, at, at its foundation and fundamental, is all I want us to do is enjoy God and enjoy each other. And I read the Bible, and I see that they had fellowship. I read the Bible, and I see that they prayed. I read the Bible, I see that they shared their faith. I read the Bible, I see that they prayed with one another. I read the Bible, and I see that they were filled with praise. I read the Bible, and I see that they saw God moving in miraculous ways amongst them. I read the Bible, and I see people who are willing to lose their head for the faith of Jesus Christ. That's what I see when I read my Bible. And so all I want is to be one of those kinds of people. And so I don't want to walk in darkness. I walked in it long enough. I want to walk in the light. 
I want to abide in the vine. I want to produce the fruit of goodness and righteousness and truth. I want that in my life. I want to be like Jesus Christ. And I want us as a group too, to be that way. As a family of God, loving God together, sharing his good news with others, and having an evangelist's heart, a willingness to tell people where Jesus can be seen and met and where their lives can be changed. You know, you may not be able to, to give all the things you'd like to give right now. Neither was I. And I still am not where I'm supposed to be. I want to be much more than I am. But I tell you this, when you just begin to put one foot before the other and keep walking with the Lord over time, your life changes. You begin to taste and see that the Lord is good. You begin to see how he opens up divine appointments and that you share with somebody you didn't even know. And they hear and they actually want to know more about Jesus Christ. You discover one day, you'll say to yourself, I haven't had a drink in months. I haven't smoked a cigarette for a long time. I haven't desired dope for a long time. And you wake up to that. See, I didn't sit down and say, one day sober, two days sober. I didn't do that. I didn't get the little badges that say, you know, 10 years, five years, whatever. I didn't get that. You know what I got? I got born again. And when I got born again, it's a, it's a lifetime of walking with Jesus Christ and being clean. That's, that's where the power came from. And so, yeah, wake up, you who sleep. Wake up, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. It's an invitation for the church and for others, but the church. Let us awaken out of stupor. Let us be aware that the, the, the time is late. Jesus is coming. Look around you and look at the signs of the times and get on fire for Jesus Christ so that people will know you're serious about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father, we ask that you would worship.